Good afternoon again and welcome to Calvary Chapel Northwest, our Sunday service and this communion service. Voice a little bit, uh, little bit scratchy, got allergies going around, a lot of respiratory things going around, a lot of babies with RSV, so please keep those things in prayer. Today, we continue our study through the book of Romans, and our text today is Romans chapter 2, verses 11 through 29. So please turn there so you can follow along with me as I read. Romans 2, starting in verse 11. For there is no partiality with God, for as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, once again, we thank you so much that we can gather in your presence as the body of Christ. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would have full control over this meeting, Lord, that he would speak to every heart, that, Lord, you would use me, use my voice, dear God, to communicate your word, that every person hearing my voice may be drawn to a closer relationship with you, Lord. And, God, if there is any in our sanctuary here or listening online that does not know you as their Savior, I pray, Lord, that today is their day of salvation. Today is the day that they surrender their heart fully to you and are born again. Lord, all of these things we ask in Jesus' name. For his sake, we pray, and for his glory. Amen. 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 The Apostle Paul is a Jew. He was born a Jew and raised a Jew. As a matter of fact, he has quite the pedigree as a Jew. Paul was schooled under the great teacher Gamaliel, a famous rabbi and member of the Sanhedrin. Paul says of himself in Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, 
circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. The Apostle Paul, this Hebrew of Hebrews, this Pharisee, is now a follower of Jesus Christ. Having interacted with the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty himself, personally on the road to Damascus. Paul has been taught by God himself and now has been given the task of reconciling God's will and purpose for the law given to the Jews with the gospel of Jesus Christ, also given to the Jews as well as to all people. Paul begins his argument here. But this argument will continue to be expounded and clarified throughout the book of Romans. And it is imperative for us to understand the proper purpose and place of God's law in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our text begins, for there is no partiality with God. For as many of sin without law will also perish without law. As many have sinned in the law will be judged by the law, for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Now, to the Jewish mind, God is partial to them. They are God's people. They are the chosen ones. They are the favorites. They believe that they are saved based on God choosing their nation. But this is a fallacy that Paul seeks to address right here at the onset as he approaches this subject matter. God is not partial. Those who have sinned outside of the law, the Gentiles, they'll perish outside of the law. And those who have sinned within the law, the Jews, will be judged by the law and condemned. It's not those who simply have the law, the hearers, who will be justified, but the doers of the law, meaning those whose lives reflect the righteousness of God. Verse 14, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Here, Paul is pointing out that God has given all people a conscience. And when that conscience is heated, it prompts one toward righteousness. It is this conscience that excuses one or else accuses one on the day of judgment. Now let's be clear. There is no person who has never violated their conscience. So all are and will be found guilty. But this shows that those who have not been given God's law directly are still accountable to God because God has written the requirements of righteousness on the hearts of mankind through conscience. Paul goes on to say that God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4.13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. There is no secret that you can keep from God. God sees all. You may have secrets that you can hide from 
other people. But God sees everything. Therefore, I encourage you. If you have things in your life that you are hiding, secret sins, I encourage you to expose those sins to the light. Allow God to remove those things from your life. God will do that, and you will experience a freedom. You will be unburdened. You will experience a lightness in your spirit. Cry out to God as the psalmist did in Psalms 139, 23 through 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Paul says that God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. I love how Paul takes ownership of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel that Paul said in chapter 1 that he is not ashamed of because it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe question I want to ask you is, is the gospel of Jesus Christ your gospel? Have you taken ownership of the gospel? Is it your good news that you just can't wait to share with every person which you are given the opportunity to share with? Allow God the Holy Spirit to perform this work in your life. To fall so in love with Jesus that the good news of salvation in Jesus, that good news that transformed your life and gave you the assurance of heaven, allow God the Holy Spirit to make that good news your gospel so you will want to tell it wherever you go. Verse 17, indeed. You are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. Paul is speaking to proud Jews. They rest on the law, meaning they lean on the law. They know the law. They approve of the law. It doesn't mean that they do the law. The case is being made that just being a possessor of God's word, even if you are in agreement with God's word, is in of itself not righteousness. There is a clear application here for many today who profess to know Christ. You see, just attending church, even if it's a solid Bible teaching church, does not equate to righteousness. Being baptized, infant, child, or adult baptism, does not equate to righteousness. Just hearing the word of God does not make you righteous. James 1, through 25 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. We need to continue in God's word, not just be a hearer, but let God, the Holy Spirit, apply God's word to our lives. Verse 19, Paul says, and you're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You see, these Jews, 
have grown up in Sabbath school. They know the word and believe that since they know the word, that they are capable instructors of others. But they have completely missed the mark. See, God does not call academics to teach his word. God is not interested in hearers of the word parroting to others what they have heard. God wants doers of the word instructing what they have lived and continue to live. See, God did not call me as your pastor or any other teacher in this body to teach theory. We are called to be examples, living out God's word every day and instructing you through actual Holy Spirit-led experiences. Hebrews 5.14 speaks of this. It says, but solid food belongs to those who are full of age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That's the rightful teachers of God's word. Those who have an experiential knowledge of living God's word and through that experience have matured in discernment. The ones that Paul is speaking of are not that way. Verse 21 says, You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? Paul is calling for introspection. He is calling for these Jews to look within and examine themselves. Those who are religious but unrelated to God need to come to the point where they recognize the truth, that they're simply pretenders in outside of a true relationship with God. And it is only through a true relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that one is empowered to live a godly life, to live that life that is pleasing to God. Anything else is just mere religion. It's just a religious pursuit, an attempt at godliness, but denying the true power of godliness. Verse 24 says, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. As it is written, that is a unfortunate commentary on the people of Paul's day, and it is no less true of the people in our day. There are so many, too many, who claim to be children of God, who misrepresent God in every way imaginable. Sadly, this doesn't only apply to those who are unbelievers. We all know of pastors and church leaders that have been involved in sin and scandal, bringing disrepute on the name of Jesus. This is ungodliness. Men who claim to walk in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, who stand behind the pulpit and proclaim the word of God, having secret sins. How do we protect ourselves from this? My meditation is 1 Corinthians 10, verse 2. It says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. See, we need to understand the truth of God's word. We need to understand that our flesh is irredeemable. Our flesh is filthy. Our flesh is not subject to God. 
And if we allow distance between ourselves and the Lord Jesus Christ, if we fail to consistently confess and forsake our sins when we are convicted by the Holy Spirit, then we too are in danger of blaspheming God's name, just as others who don't even know him. This is something that we should give our full attention to. We are called to be holy as God is holy. We are called to grow in sanctification. We are called to grow in our relationship with the Lord Jesus. As we continue to examine our lives, we may not be sinless, but we should always be able to look back on our past where we started with Jesus to where we are now. And we should always be able to say, I may not be sinless, but I sin less. And we should sin less and less as we grow in grace in our relationship with the Lord Jesus. Verse 25, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Now, circumcision is an interesting thing. It was the sign that God gave to identify recipients of his covenant. And it has always intrigued me. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. But it's always intrigued me that God chose this method to set his people apart. Genesis 17, 9 through 14 tells us about it and what God thinks about it. It says, God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant. You and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Have you ever thought about circumcision? I mean, what I find so interesting is that circumcision is so intimate and so private. It's not a visible symbol. As an adult, no one sees your circumcision except yourself, your wife, and God, of course. And another interesting thing to note is that once this policy of circumcision was established, the males that was then circumcised really had nothing to do with it because they were eight days old when it happened. It was obedience by their parents that they were circumcised. So it is for these reasons that obviously the act of circumcision in itself is not justification before God. And God goes on to expound and elaborate in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Verses 12 through 17. He says, and now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, 
also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them. You above all peoples as it is this day. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. See, true circumcision goes far beyond the physical act. It is, as Deuteronomy says, cutting away the foreskin of the heart. It is exposing your heart to God, committing yourself to him, following after his righteousness. This is the point that Paul is making as he addresses these men that are so proud of their physical circumcision. This symbol of connection with God when this physical symbol has absolutely no benefit if they are not following God wholeheartedly. Verse 26, therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not Not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with the written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law. Paul is making a logical argument here. He is disassembling their confidence in an outward symbol while inwardly being unrighteous. It's actually a genius argument because not only does Paul get them to introspect on their own unrighteousness, Paul presents this fictitious person outside of the Jewish faith that is uncircumcised yet walking in unrighteousness. This fictitious person, fictitious person of Paul's creation is there to open their mind to understand that you don't have to just be a Jew to be right with God. And why do I say that this person is fictitious? Because as we will learn as we continue through the book of Romans, that there is no one, either circumcised or uncircumcised, that is truly righteous before God. Theoretically, if someone were to have perfect righteousness, even without the act of physical circumcision, that person would be righteous before God. But it's only theoretical because no one in and of themselves can produce righteousness in and of themselves. Verse 28, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Paul is using Jew here symbolically to represent all who are truly justified before God. All pretension all confidence in outward symbols, all labels need to be laid aside. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. The question that matters is this. Are you truly right with God? Some will answer, oh, I'm a Jew. I'm circumcised. It doesn't matter. 
Oh, I'm, I'm Baptist. I was raised in the church. Nope, it doesn't matter. I'm Catholic. I was baptized as an infant. I've been confirmed. I go to mass. I confess to my priest. Doesn't matter. Your labels don't matter. Your religion doesn't matter. Your works don't matter. Are you born again? That's what matters. John 3.3. 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Are you born again? Is there evidence that you are born again? Evidence of being born again is that your life has changed. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Has your life changed? These are the questions that matter. Are you born again? And is there evidence of your new birth? That evidence being a changed life, a strong desire to be righteous, and a hunger for God's word. If you can answer those questions in the affirmative, then you are right with God. Circumcision or uncircumcision aside, only the righteousness of Jesus Christ through the new birth is God's righteousness. If there's any here or listening online that have not surrendered themselves to Jesus and have been born again, I want to give you the opportunity. If you're here as a believer, and you've allowed distance to come between you and the Lord Jesus Christ, and you know that you need to renew yourself to him, confess your sin, and ask for a renewed spirit, I want to give you that opportunity. So please bow your heads and pray with me. Gracious God, come before you, Lord. We thank you for who you are. Lord, we ask God that as your Holy Spirit has spoken through your words, as Lord God, you have drawn hearts to yourself, any Lord God who is willing to repent, to turn from their sin and turn to you, Lord God, we want to give them the opportunity now to receive the Lord Jesus is their Savior. If that's you, if you're here and you know that you don't have full confidence that you are going to heaven, that you are standing in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, in the privacy of closed eyes and bowed heads, I want to give you that opportunity to receive the Lord now. Is there any here that needs to receive Jesus? Just simply raise your hand and I will acknowledge your hand and pray with you. Is there any in our sanctuary? If you're listening online, I can't see your hand, but God sees your heart. If you know that it's time to surrender yourself to Jesus, it's just as simple as calling on his name. The Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus' blood paid the price for your sins. His resurrection from the dead was God's stamp of approval that he received the sacrifice of Christ on your behalf. Simply cry out to him, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me. Come into my life, and you will have the assurance as the Holy Spirit births you into God's family that your life has been changed. Father, I thank you <clears throat> for those, God, that may have come to you in salvation. Lord, for your children 
that need to renew themselves to you, Lord. God, before we come to your communion table right now, Lord, as we examine our own hearts, I pray, Lord, that every child of yours right now is turning to you, confessing their sin, and receiving a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. As your word content, commands us, dear God, to constantly be filled with your spirit at all times. Fill us afresh and renew us, God, unto you as we come before your communion table. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you don't have your communion elements and you are a member of God's family, we invite you to participate. If you need an uh, element, just raise your hand, and the usher will make sure you get one. As was said, this is a, a family celebration, meaning if you belong to Jesus Christ, if you are born again, you are part of God's family, and, and this is for you. This is a, a right that Jesus instituted. On the night that he was betrayed. He was having dinner with his disciples, the Passover meal. We call it the, the Last Supper. And at that meal, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Now, it wasn't Jesus' actual body. Jesus was still in his actual body. It doesn't become Jesus' actual body. It is a symbol of his body. This represents my body, is what he was communicating. Broken for you, because Jesus' body was broken. Isaiah tells us that to look at Jesus, you wouldn't be able to recognize him as a man. He was so marred. He was hanging on that cross naked, beaten with Roman whips, with, with pieces of metal and bone, tearing his flesh to ribbons. Naked. There was no loincloth. There was no little slit in his side and his flesh intact. Jesus was ripped to shreds humiliated, innocent of any wrongdoing, the sinless son of God hanging on that cross, body being broken. Why? For me. Because I'm a sinner. For you. Because you are a sinner. And Jesus purchased our way back to God. This is my body broken for you. As often as you take it, take it in remembrance of me. Let's do like same time Jesus took the cup and he blessed it he said this is my blood the blood of the new covenant I'm so grateful of the new covenant we're studying the law and that transition of law and grace and Paul is gonna he's gonna deal with this thoroughly because he's talking to a mixed audience of Jews and Gentiles. And we need to understand and be so grateful that we don't live under the law. That we don't have to strive to keep the law because by the law, no flesh can be justified. There was only one man who could ever keep the law perfectly. And that was Jesus. He fulfilled the law. He shed his blood. And now the new covenant is the covenant of grace, a free gift of salvation to all who will receive him. He purchased that in his blood. And he said, as often as you take of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Let's do likewise. Lord Jesus, 
We thank you for your sacrifice, Lord, and we do. We remember you, Lord God, every second of every day. Let us never forget, Lord, the price that you paid for our salvation, for our eternity. And let us continue to worship and glorify you and take that gospel, my gospel, with us wherever we go and share it. Because that's the price that you paid, Lord. We love you and we praise you, Lord God. And we ask God to bless us as we worship you in one final worship song today and then dismiss us in your presence. In your holy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Please stand for our final worship. Amen. Let's worship the Lord one last time.